We build houses out of such fragile things, whether it be wood, stone, planes, or bombs, but they stand on guard like soldiers. No bullets outside of mines and steel wire wrapped around chain link fences to keep attack dogs away from children running up and down the street, throwing pine cones at bicycles. The soldiers watch over block long drag races, engines pumping gasoline and Kool Aid fumes, sticky fingers licked clean by ferrets who learned not to bite via rotten apple spray training or by dogs on long leashes that run more slowly as they age. The soldiers age too. You can see it in the sky, wildfire smoke sky, or is that army smoke burned to the ground on a summer morning? Black smoke rise up like a flare gun. Black smoke pour out like a hose on the front lawn where we used to watch our neighbors shoot off illegal fireworks on the 4th. Red and blue lights all night, so close to our heads, we swore the windows shook as if they was tweaking, like he was when the cops showed up. Or was he burning? Or was he burnt out like the soldiers up the block? Shingles falling off grandfather roofs, cracked like cancer bones, left on the ground for us civilians to sweep up after the windstorm. Of course the houses cannot clean up after themselves. They must stand on guard like soldiers trapped in their terracotta pots while the city grows around them like a tomb. And we remain immigrants, refugees, bus drivers, teachers, and ex-pilots. Even as the 50s paint exterior peels away from the mind of the city, we'll be here like the walls of the old library, still standing engulfed by the new building. Painful, but necessary, like shin splints or dying. And in time, this, the houses will stand like soldiers in the Museum of Memories, and the walls will be forgotten while we watch, hardening like clay. That's a poem I wrote about my house. <laughs> now, my house isn't very special or flashy, but it has an interesting history. In 1934, the U.S. government evicted the city, the residents of the city of Richland, to begin the Manhattan Project. They needed to make an entirely new city to house all the workers and scientists that would be working on the atomic bomb. So they hired Spokane-based architect G.A. Ferson to design the entire city. He had a 90-day deadline to do it. Ferson designed 26 different houses. And these were called the alphabet houses because there's 26 letters in the alphabet. <laughs> Clever guy. Uh, I lived in an A house for most of my life, first as a duplex, and then at uh, a house that was converted into a single-family residence. Production of the alphabet houses continued post-World War II all the way through the Korean War. So there's a bunch of them. Now, the city doesn't look like this anymore. It's changed a whole lot, and it's grown a whole lot. And the people that are living in the alphabet houses have changed too. While originally it was people that were working out at the Hanford Project, most of those people don't live in these houses anymore. Instead, they live in new communities farther north and farther south of the city. While Richland as a city shifts and grows, what could potentially happen to the rest of the alphabet houses? Part of that's already been answered. In 2005, a portion of the alphabet houses was recognized as a Gold Coast Historic District. However, that's basically the only recognition the city's had over the past decade or so. So one way that we can find out what could happen in the future of the alphabet houses is by looking at other communities within the United States and seeing what happened to them and their buildings. The community that I want to look at is Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, before we compare Pruitt Igo to the alphabet houses, there are some basic, obvious differences. First of all, Pruitt Igo were a bunch of high rise apartment complexes, while the alphabet houses were single family or dual family dwellings. Pruitt Igo was never owned by its residents, instead, it was always controlled by the city. And while the alphabet houses started out being controlled by the city, at this point, they are now all privately owned. St. Louis, Missouri also has a history of racial tensions. And while Richland isn't free of its interesting perspectives on race, <laughs> it's unlikely that race is going to be a factor in what happens to these homes. Now that we've gotten the big differences out of the way, we can look at what things these communities have in common. 
So the main goal of Peru Igo in the beginning was to fix suburbanization. Wealthier residents of St. Louis had begun moving to the suburbs in droves. This caused central St. Louis to reduce in value to the point where they had become slums everywhere. Now, it's not as bad as it was in St. Louis here, but we do see the same patterns. Wealthier residents of Richland tend to live in communities outside of the alphabet houses, even though the alphabet houses were the beginning foundation establishment of the Richland. This is to the point where a local elementary school, very close to the river, where there are very high property value houses, has 90% of its students using free or reduced lunch. This is higher than any other school in the entire district. Now, Prude Igo, as it decayed, became associated with crime. We see the same type of associations with the alphabet houses, but not nearly as directly. Nobody says, oh boy, those alphabet houses sure are messed up. But if you ask Richland residents what places they want to avoid when they're out and about or when it gets dark, they're almost always associated with alphabet houses. This is actually what got me to think about this to begin with. I was at a local gas station, and after an interaction between a customer and a clerk, another customer said, boy, this part of town sure is crazy. It was instantaneously clear that he was talking about where I was living. Now, Prude Igo was a very expensive project, but it was also done as cheaply as possible, which meant that it fell apart over time. Now, we can see clearly that the alphabet houses have cupped up pretty well over the past 75 years. However, the cost of upkeep of these houses as they age is only going to get more and more expensive. A pretty basic example of this is air conditioning. It gets very hot in the summer with weeks that every day is 100 plus degrees. Now, a brand new air conditioning unit is over $8,000. If you're a lower-income family and your air conditioner breaks, it's going to be very difficult to be able to keep up and get a new air conditioner. It is very possible that we see these houses decay as the upkeep gets more and more expensive. But so what? So what? What does this mean? At the moment, not too much. Yes, there are a bunch of lower-income residents living in the central part of Richland. But there's nothing that is on the horizon or looming that says there's going to be some massive shift that's going to be destructive to these communities. However, things being okay at the moment does not mean that things are going to be okay forever. And for me, the thing that worries me the most happens every time I look at those beautiful hills. Now, as a kid, these hills were almost completely empty. You would drive on the highway and just see sagebrush. Now, every year, there's more and more houses up there. There's new developments at parts of the highway that weren't there three years ago. As long as there's a market, our city is going to continue to expand. But what happens when land developers don't have any more room to build more houses? What happens when the commute from South Richland becomes so long that it isn't even worth the time? What happens if people that have, if there's new houses, people with higher incomes that live in the alphabet houses say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm going to live in a new house far away. We're going to see a similar situation that we saw in St. Louis. Richland as a whole is a city in flux. On the one hand, it's a small town that helped to make an atomic bomb that killed tens of thousands of people, which, <laughs> or, had some scientific innovation, let's say that instead. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, Richland is an emerging community full of art, full of music, full of people with great ideas that are making things that we're going to spread all across the world, right? So what do we do when we're in this spot? Because we could, in theory, let people with higher incomes come into the alphabet houses and renovate them, but that could destroy the community that was already there. One more thing about Pearson. When he designed the alphabet houses, when he designed the community of Richland, one thing that he wanted to make sure of is that the people that were working on the Hanford project would all be in a community. It was designed strategically so that people would say hello to each other when they were on the street, because you can't avoid your neighbors there. You, you really cannot avoid your neighbors there. <laughs>
It's how I met my bus driver. She was walking her ferrets up and down the street. I wasn't lying about the apple spray. She literally. It's how I met my neighbors who were shooting off fireworks. It's how I met refugees that live a couple blocks from where I live. Our cities are made by our communities. And as the future comes, we have to make sure that we're not destroying the thing that makes our city who we are. So what to do about it? I don't know. I live right over there, man. Like, we've got people of all different types, with all different types of ideas. We might not have the money or the clout or the government positions, but we've got our brains. And if you just give us a chance, we might surprise you. Thank you.